Today's video, we're going to take a look at historical plasters and poultices. What is a medicated plaster? A medicated plaster consists of a roller bandage of fabric or later India rubber in which an ointment was made with a variety of compounds including herbs, beeswax, and resins. It was spread on the bandages and applied to the needed area delivering relief. In the 18th century, you could do this yourself. In the 19th century, these bandages were pre-made and sold with ointment impregnated into them. In 1879, we see the first plaster making machinery. Previously, this ointment was made separately, kept in a jar, and you bought or provided your own roller bandage. What is a medicated poultice? A poultice comes from the Latin word pulse, meaning porridge. It is also known as a cataplasm. A poultice is a soft, moist mass, often consisting of powdered vegetable matter, that is heated and spread over a cloth to treat minor aches and pains. After application, a roller bandage is usually applied. In comparison to plasters, poultices generally have no beeswax or rosin in them. We have a brand new historical product in our shop. This is a plaster for swellings. The original recipe came from an early 18th century handwritten recipe book from Glasgow in Scotland. So a poultice is a soft, moist mass of material, typically plant material or flour, applied to the body to relieve soreness and inflammation and kept in place with a cloth. What does a plaster and a poultice have to do with each other? They're basically the same terms. One is a little bit older than the other. So in the 18th century, we use the term plaster. This is a topical application. We're gonna to go to a medicinal book from 1768 to get a bit more information about plasters. Plasters are composed chiefly of oily substances united with powders to such continents that the compound may remain firm and cold without sticking to the fingers that it may be soft and pliable in small amounts of heat, and that by the warmth of the human body, it be so tenacious and readily to adhere both to the part on which it is applied and to the substance on which it is spread. There is, however, a difference in the continence of plasters according to the purposes that they are to be applied to thus, such as are intended for the breast, the stomach should be very soft and yielding, whilst those intended for the limbs may be made firmer and more adhesive. Adding an ounce of expressed oil and an ounce of yellow wax to half an ounce of any proper powder will make a plaster of the stiffest continence. For a hard one, one ounce of wax, a half more ounce of powder may be added to plasters that may likewise be made of resins, gummy resins, especially without wax. It has been supposed that plasters may be impregnated with specific virtues of different vegetables boiling vegetables and oil in a composition of the plaster to prevent the matter from contracting a black color after which the liquid is strained off. Let it on the fire again until the moisture has exhaled. We have already observed that this treatment does not communicate the oils to very valuable quantities, even relative to their use in the fluid state. So basically, plasters are used as a topical application for the skin. We use them with wax and resins. They need to be hard yet soft. They need to be able to be applied to the bandage in the skin and not stick to the skin or the bandage, but yet adhere where it benefits both the patient and the wound or the swelling to be healed. So there's a lot of different types of plasters. This one specifically was for swellings. Now, when you start to use this one, you're going to see that it, it probably will work for other things but we want to go over exactly kind of what it looks like. If you want to do the historical method of making a plaster, a plaster bandage, we want to show you guys exactly how that's done. Historically now, because we're going with the theme of Outlander inspired products, this one fits in really well because we have the original manuscript to work from. So in giving you Outlander inspired products, we wanted to still keep them historical, where this is something that Claire could have actually made or had the recipe to because the recipe actually already exists. What we want to do is we want to show you guys how this works. So as you can see here, um, I can touch it and it's pretty stiff. There isn't, um, you know, much that comes off, but if I push my finger into it, you do get some. Now this is very soft, so it'll be very spreadable onto a bandage. Um, if you Put it on your skin overnight without a bandage. If you just put it on your skin, 
you can let it sit and it will, it will dry to a point of being almost like a second skin um, where you can see how nice it fits in. So if you've ever seen like the second skin, um, you'll be able to, to um, leave this on without a bandage. But with any sort of plasters or poultices, it's, it's better to bandage them. So let's show you how that is done. This book comes from 1909, it's called The Roller Bandage, and it talks about bandages, gauze bandages, and this whole book is to uh, have you be able to practice how to properly bandage. I just wanted to read to you a little bit about this. Um, it talks about bandaging is really important and you need to kind of familiarize yourself with the subject, with a series of illustrations, each bandage is applied to a living model and that they had to, to redo the pictures because there was a fire in the warehouse. So uh, a definition of a roller bandage. This is considered a roller bandage. The definition is a term roller bandage is used to describe a strip of muslin or other material rolled into a cylindrical form. When other materials than muslin is employed, however, the bandage is usually designed as a rubber, a gauze, a flannel, or crinoline bandage. So what you need for this, your materials. Now I'm gonna do with the 18th century method and I'm going to use linen, but now this is a little bit later method or earlier for us, depending on how you wanna look at it. They're talking about unbleached muslin of medium quality is best applied for the purposes of an ordinary roller. This is torn into strips of required length and breadth, removing the salvage and leaving the ravel as much undisturbed as possible. Gauze for the aseptic bandages and crinolines for plasters of Paris are cut into strips of required dimensions. These materials cannot be torn evenly. India rubber rolls are usually procured, ready-made, though pure rubber sheeting of different weights is available for special bandages. So here it shows you how to roll it. You can either roll it by hand or you can have a key to help you roll these bandages. Now in Claire's time, you could actually get bandages that were already rolled and ready to go. And this one even says, you know, pressed edge, interrupt, sterilized after packaging. So this is just a really great box. There is no bandages in this one, but you can see it's got a little soldier on, so it's wartime. The difference between calling this a plaster and them using the idea of the plaster of Paris is this. So in the 18th century, a plaster did not have to involve the plaster of Paris in order to be wrapped up. But later on, we see where a plaster now has just the term of a cast. We would consider it a cast. Um, plaster of Paris bandages is, is pretty much a cast. So um, plaster of Paris bandages are a little different from the plasters, but they're coming from the same term. It's just a different time period. So the first thing you're going to need to do is you, you have your swellings, um, your plaster. It's a beautiful pink color. You're going to want to take your protection off. Okay. Get rid of that. Recycle that. All right. So here you go. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to open it and take a look at it. And if you can see it, it's a very beautiful pink color. You might not be able to see the color completely on the camera, but it's a very beautiful pink color. I mean, you can turn it upside down and it won't come out. We're going to work from this guy right here. This is a 18th century reproduced medicinal jar. So if you're into Outlander, this is something that Claire probably would have had quite a few of these laying around. They held everything from pomades to salves to ointments um, and even used for little jars to put to store like beeswax and such in. So the first thing that we're going to do is we need to cut strips. So I have this linen here. This is just a random piece of linen that has been laying around. The first thing that we're going to do is we need to decide how wide we want our linen to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm just gonna use um, my finger approximate width here and I'm gonna go a little bit extra. So it's about three inches. Now it's a little hard to pull linen. Like if you were using a wool or cotton, you would just be able to pull the material. But with using linen, it's a little different. It's a little bit harder to do. So we're gonna cut another strip. So there's two ways you're going to be able to fasten these. Pins are one method that you can use. 
and we may just use a big one just so you guys can actually see the pins. Another method is by slicing each of your pieces a little bit. Here we have a gentleman and you can see how he is tied right here. He's just tied in a knot. You can see them using the roller bandage and just kind of rolling it over him. So this is a roller bandage, roller bandage right. methods of securing. So here we go. So as you can see, they have pins here to secure. To secure the terminal extremity of the roller, either a pin is used, which includes one or more of the previous turns, or the end is slit into two tails, which is then carried around to the part in the opposite direction and tied. The pin may be introduced parallel or at the right angles with the long axis of the limb. So what you will need is you'll need a square of material. I'm going to cut it in half. So here you have a square here, and you have a square here. This is the area I'm going to be working on now. I had a wrist crush injury a while ago um, when I worked in professional theater. <laughs> so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to use um, a spatula or a knife and you are going to spread it on the plaster. And you want to make sure when you're cutting the bandages that if this is the area, you want the bandage to fit nicely over this area. Just like that. That is the first part. Now, this second part here, this is a good bandage right here. It's folded over. This would not be a great bandage, but you know, in times of need, you're not gonna, you're not gonna mess with that. So the first thing, it would come over like this. These two would be tied. And tied like this. So now you wanna take this next one. And you are going to do the same thing. This is easier when you have two people. <laughs> it's a little bit harder when you are doing it yourself. Okay. So here's the first one, and then you would loop it around again. So here you go. My plaster is right here. And it's covered up. It's not going to seep through. So one more time. Nice and neat. And you can see how it's soaked through that portion of it. Um, it does not adhere to my skin. I can easily peel it off. I can easily put it back on. So let's try this again. So the other method you can use if you want to stick with the historical application of a plaster or a poultice is using the pin method. So the first thing you're going to do is you have your band of fabric right here. Okay, I'm going to flip it like this. And the amount of plaster that you put on, um, or the amount of the, the amount of the poultice that you put on, really depends on your area that you're covering. So, for example, I'm covering this, so we want that to cover that that much of the area. And when you spread it on, try to spread it on evenly. Now, this method involves pins, right? And so we're going to take the bandage. We're going to fold this in under so it can be nice, neat, and tidy. And then your pin would go here. And by putting it in this way, he or she will not be able to pick anyone. Have it in there. It's close to the skin. This is where it's going to stay. So then this is what our poultice or our plaster looks like. Let's go over some of the modern methods that you can use. Um, you can use these nonstick pads, which actually, if you look, it says a cushion that protects you without sticking to the wounds, right? We've learned that that is actually part of the historical plaster or, or the historical poultice. You just don't have to make that. So if we would use one of these, we would take it out. And then you would apply your plaster. And then you would just put your plaster there. And then look, here it says, clean it, apply it, cover the wound. And then you would secure it with rolled gauze or wrap or medical tape. So this is actually part of the um, poultice and the plasters, but just a new way of doing it. So this is one way of doing it, and you could just cover it with some gauze. Another method is using a Band-Aid. So 
for those that have just small boo-boos, in the 18th century, you have to make or go purchase things from the apothecary. You wouldn't, you know, just have like a random band-aid sitting around. This would be a band-aid historically, you know. So what you would do for this is you would put a little bit on here. And then whatever finger is bothering you, you know, you could just put it up here, wrap it around. Or if you have problems with something, you could just put it just like that. So it works either way. I wanted to go over a few of the historical plasters. Here we have some original recipes for historic plasters where you're taking burgundy pitch, uh, labdomum, yellow resin, yellow wax, expressed oil, a pinch of resin. So those are for like legs and arms, like ma major things that have to get fixed where these softer ones are for, you know, the stomach or swellings, um, not necessarily a broken arm. We have this amazing book here titled The Cottage Physician. And um, this book is not in great shape. It was 1897 was the publication date. And if we just kind of look here, for a poultice for external inflammations. Here they tell us that a ripe onion boiled to a pulp, one pound bran, pour the onion and the liqueur they have been boiled into the bran while it's hot, mixed well and apply. A very useful poultice. Here's another one for smoothing and softening. Slippery elm bark, powdered marshmallow leaves, uh, linseed oil, boil the leaves in the water, mix in the powder the meal, the grease, the lard, and apply. This is useful for swellings and other inflammatory. Uh, so you have quite a few here to choose from. So plasters were a very important part of history. Our specific plaster is made from a lot of the historical types of ingredients that were used. So for example, a lot of original plasters had things like honey, or they had things like resins, beeswax. If you look up our listing for this plaster. It talks a bit more about the history. One of the oldest medical manuscripts known to man is on a clay tablet that dates back to 2200 BC. And on that tablet, it describes for the first time so far, because you know, things are always changing, the three healing gestures, which talks about how to wash the wounds, how to make a plaster and bandaging the wounds. So today, a plaster would be known as a wound dressing, just like they did here. You know, they dressed the wounds. But historically, plasters were a mixture of substances that included mud, clay, plants, honey, beer, and herbs. They were applied to the wounds to provide protection and to absorb any seepage. One of the most common ingredients used in the plasters was oil and honey. They provided protection from infection and bacteria and also would have prevented bandages from sticking to the wounds. What does this original recipe plaster for the swellings do? So it's a plaster salve or ointment that historically was used to take down any type of swellings. But you can try it on open wounds and you would just apply the mixture with bandages or wrapping just like we showed you. You have to let us know how you like it. So the ingredients of this include castor oil, organic chickweed, organic chamomile, organic goat's root, organic wormwood, organic beeswax, organic honey, organic spearmint, vinegar, and rye meal. So while we can't say that this cures anything, we can say that you should give it a try because it was a historical application that was used. Uh, this is a perfectly harmless historical application. And let us know how you guys like it. This is definitely something that Claire would have been able to put together. The recipe already existed at her time when she was there. And so she could have easily added extra things like the castor oil to it. Now, castor oil was available in the 18th century. It was available for things like uh, constipation. And so it wasn't really used per se in the 18th century where we think of like beauty methods. Now in some cultures they may have, but mostly in the 18th century it was medicinal, which is why we felt that we could put it in here. Now the original recipe just talked about oil. A lot of times these original recipes, they don't give any sort of amounts or they're very vague or like where this came from, uh, it had actually local terms, local slang, terms at that time for plants and herbs. So we have to do a lot of research to figure it out what they're talking about. But we think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Um, stop on over at www.litttlebits.etsy.com and try an original plaster for swelling from 18th century uh, Glasgow.
Enjoy.